So hi everybody, I'm going to start off. The format we've decided on uh, is that each of us will speak briefly uh, so that we can spend most of the time with you answering questions and having a discussion because I'm sure you're here both because, I, I mean I'm sure you're here because you'd like to express how you feel as well. So I'll, I'll begin uh, with a, sort of an overview of the legislation briefly and as the Vice President Joe Biden said, uh, to uh, whisper to the president, which then was uh, broadcast all over America, using an expletive as an adjective, which I will not use, this is a big deal. And uh, it actually is, it culminates a century of trying to pass comprehensive health care reform in this country. There have been seven attempts since Teddy Roosevelt in the early 1900s. And if you have followed the saga of this health care reform effort, you know it has died and, and resurrected at least two or three times over the last year. Um, so what is the bill that finally squeaked through without a single Republican vote in any part of the process except for dear Olympia Snow on the Finance Committee side? One vote. Um, so what is it? Big picture. It expands coverage to virtually all Americans, 95% of legal citizens, 92% of all Americans. It will ban health insurers from uh, discriminating uh, with, about pre-existing conditions, uh, health status, and for the first time, gender. As Nancy Pelosi said the other day, no longer will being a woman uh, be a pre-existing condition. Um, and so it removes a lot of the ways that insurance companies uh, currently decide who they will insure and who they will not. It closes over time the donut hole in the Medicare program, if you know about that, the prescription drug program, creates what are called health insurance exchanges where health insurance companies can advertise their products, they'll be highly regulated, they'll all have to cover at least a minimum set of benefits that'll be the same and then people who go to the exchange to purchase health insurance can choose among them. The idea is through that competition, it will keep uh, costs reasonable and quality high. It invests in training more primary care physicians. We all know that we're sitting on a physician shortage, particularly in primary care. We're going to have 32 million people with health insurance. They're all going to need a doctor. Uh, it uh, incorporates new payment methods as demonstration projects that will shift the way we pay physicians from a, on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, a fee-for-service fee basis, to more of a value-based uh, payment model, looking somewhat at capitated models. And it establishes a Comparative Effectiveness Institute, which will compare medical treatments. How do we? That's sort of a basic overview of the bill. President Obama, when he ran for president, said he wanted to expand coverage, uh, begin constraining the growth in costs in our health care system, and make a more high quality, value driven health care system. Uh, the first is certainly a given we're expanding coverage. Uh, the second, not so much. The bill doesn't have a lot of cost control mechanisms in it explicitly. And third, the quality piece um, is really through these demonstration projects and a lot of people are feeling that a lot more work needs to be done to tie up that aspect of it as well. How is it paid for? A trillion dollars over uh, 10 years, actually $938 billion over 10 years. It's paid for through uh, half of it is paid for through Medicare changes, changes in the Medicare Advantage plans, and cuts to Medicare not on the benefit side, but in the growth and uh, the reimbursements to hospitals, physicians not at, at this time. The other half is paid for through penalties, fees, there are increased fees on the insurance company, on the pharmaceutical industry, medical device industry, higher income Americans will pay an additional payroll tax for Medicare, uh, and also an unearned, on their unearned income, they'll pay an additional tax on that as well. So it's through fees and taxes and changes in the Medicare system. It's basically how we're paid for it. So I think I'll stop there and turn it over to Dr. Massaro. If a year ago when um, this, all, this process started, the doctors looked at the three goals that were defined then, um, I think there was probably a fair 
amount of anxiety in the medical community. Uh, the three goals being, of course, insurance reform, payment reform, and enhancement of quality activities. I think today the medical infrastructure probably breathes a sigh of relief that it dodged potential bullets. This is, for all intents and purposes, an insurance reform bill. And as Carolyn had suggested, the issues of payment reform and quality are, less, are left to study groups and some future Congress and maybe some future administration to deal with. So in that regard, doctors um, dodged bullets. They didn't get their two primary goals, which I think at the time would have been some sense of malpractice reform. There, there is some money that's going to allow the Secretary of HHS to do some studies, but we've been studying those issues for a long time. Um, and um, they didn't get uh, an adjustment to uh, a very onerous component of the Medicare reimbursement uh, uh, structure, and that has to do with sustainable growth methodology, which suggests that at least today, if the law were implemented, physicians' fees for Medicare patients would be reduced automatically by 21%. That's been forestalled for the past 12 years, I think it is, by Congress. Physicians would have liked to have seen that um, changed, but it didn't occur, mostly because of the financial implications. It's in the several hundred million, billion uh, dollar implications, and it couldn't have met the um, OMB criteria. So what did doctors get? I think that in this sausage making characteristic, Mr. Obama really tried to give everybody a little bit, preparing them at some point to give away. I, I, I think doctors got a reinforcement of the movement toward primary care. Um, Probably the best way that this was expressed is that in the new patients that will now go under the Medicaid program, they will, the Medicaid physician fees will now be mandated to be equivalent to Medicare. And for a primary care doc practicing in a small town where Medicaid and Medi Medicare are both important, delivering the same service to the same sort of government health sector, uh, physicians could get reimbursed as much as 50% less by caring for a Medicaid patient as opposed to paying for a Medicare patient. So now in primary care, there will be 100% of the Medicare allowed rate delivered for all the new enrollees in the Medicaid programs. So that's that's probably the most significant issue for docs. As, as Carolyn indicated, there are also some additional incentives and bonuses for primary care docs. There's a 10% incentive for docs who provide more than 60% of their Medicare services to office-based practices, nursing home practice, and home visits. So trying to reinforce the value in the system of non-procedure based doctors and trying to give them a floor to their income so that they can, we, we, we can look at medical students with an honest face and say you should go into primary care. Um, again, malpractice wasn't affected, but on the other hand, nor was the uh, was the fee for service system uh, attacked very much at all. So th those were, I think, all in all, medicine dodged its bullet on this one. Hopefully, there'll be a few chits because th I think probably all three of us believe you're not going to get the other two characteristics of uh, modifying payment reform and certainly improving quality and efficiency of the system without having the docs in the table and the docs being willing to give something up. It didn't have to do that on this one. 
So my brief is to discuss the law, um, and most of that centers on the constitutionality of the individual mandate. Um, and I will preface this by saying that I am not a constitutional scholar, um, so uh, you're getting what you're paying for in that sense. <laughs> um, but given that I've been studying health reform for quite a while, I have looked into this um, in some detail. Um, and I'll try and take it down through different layers. Uh, to start with, there, uh, Ron Wyden, for example, Senator Wyden, would argue there's no issue whatsoever because in the final bill he included an amendment empowering the states to be innovative amendment, which um, essentially says that the states can opt out as long as they meet the federal coverage uh, issues within the actual bill that was passed. I think that may beg the question a little bit because I'm not sure you can meet the federal coverage uh, requirements in the bills without actually having some sort of individual mandate in there. So I think that may end up being circular. So then what's the power of uh, Congress to do this? It essentially comes under two powers that I think most of you in this room are very familiar with from constitutional law, the power to tax and the, and the commerce power. Uh, Jack Balkin had an article in the New England Journal of Medicine last fall that, showing my own jurisprudence probably, I found fairly convincing, arguing that it is a, a tax quite clearly. What he says, maybe not so clearly, um, what he says essentially, and this is actually an important difference between the Senate bill and the House bill, is that what happens here is that the tax is actually the penalty you pay when you don't pay in, in, by insurance. So it's not requiring you to buy insurance, it's requiring you to pay a penalty if you don't buy insurance. And that actual distinction is important within the taxing power. And in fact, the Senate bill is structured exactly in that way to structure it as a penalty and includes IRS code amendments. Um, if you don't buy that, we then move into the commerce issue. Um, which is, to my mind, um, well, I don't know between the tax and the commerce, but it is uh, under the structure of the court's current jurisprudence, the strongest argument. Um, and this really brings us to a series of cases, again, that should be fairly familiar to law students in the room, and that would be Morrison, Lopez, and Raich. And the important thing within the Commerce Clause argument is that race is the last word. And I don't see, and, and this is one of those few areas where you count justices and it really matters. And I don't see how you get to five um, after race. The only uh, justice I'm relatively certain uh, would find uh, that this isn't commerce might be Thomas. Um, but I don't even see Scalia under some of uh, Scalia's recent articulations going that way. And so I think that the argument that you can get past race is fairly weak. And I also think it's important to recognize that the people who um, are proposing those arguments are the very people who actually wrote the briefs in race that lost. Um, so the court wasn't convinced then, and I don't necessarily see anything moving the court in the opposite direction right now. There are also some lawsuits for uh, principally the Florida lawsuit that argues that this bill puts a great deal of pressure on the states uh, in terms of Medicaid payments. Um, constitutionally, I think you have to go all the way back to national cities v. Ussery to make that work. and. We left that a long time ago, so I don't think it meets those standards to start with. Um, but even beyond that, uh, I think it's important to remember that Medicaid is voluntary. Um, so <coughs> the states do have the option not to take Medicaid. Um, and Medicaid is a double-edged, well, both a sword and a, a rose in the sense that <laughs> Stick in a um, it gives states a lot of expenditures, but quite clearly states that are expanding their Medicaid uh, payments are doing so because they're getting a multiplier effect that is actually benefiting their economies. So I don't think there's any clear argument to be said that the Medicaid issues here will be actually a cost and not a benefit. I think we need real data to be able to show that, and that data's not there. 
Uh, the final legal piece I'd say is um, this is by uh, absolutely a bonanza for lawyers. Um, it may actually change the legal market for young lawyers completely by itself. Uh, we have the requirement of creating new agency, requiring regulations supporting all of this, all before 2014, and that's just kind of the government piece. You have all the private sector piece trying to understand how this is going to affect them. And although I agree it's really only an insurance reform bill, because it's an insurance reform bill in health care, it touches so much of our economy that that is going to keep people very, very busy. Um, and I generally view that as a good thing, um, but that shows where I am. Job security for your students. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Questions? I was just curious. Um, obviously, in past years, Congress has sort of swooped in at the end of the year to ensure that physicians don't see a draconian cut in their payments. Is that something that's expected to continue? Or? It's actually expected to occur today. Oh, right. um, they ran out last night, or maybe they took Well, they're on recess for two weeks, so they've given them a two-week grace <laughs> period. Right. But it is actually, I've been trying to follow several websites, and if you go on the, the AMA Met website, they actually have a, a clock counting down to when uh, the sustainable growth uh, guillotine drops again. So yes, it's it's expected um, that there will be another short-term reprieve. No, no one knows how long. And, and so will that occur again next year and the year after that, and presumably? Well, right now, in order to fix the SGR, it's going to cost about three hundred billion dollars. And the way, the way it seems to me that the uh, temperament in Congress is right now, the deficit is so large they are not going to pass anything unless they can figure out a way to pay for it. Uh, and so unless and until they come up with a way to find that $300 billion, I think they will be band-aids. But I, I agree with Tom. I think, I think that the AMA valiantly, through their support behind the bill, hoping, thinking the quid pro quo would be that the SGR would be fixed. It wasn't. It was included originally in the House bill and then dropped early on. Um, but I, you can bet there's going to be lots of phone calls and lobbying to somehow pay back the physician community for their support. Uh, and I think that's going to be one of the two main issues that Tom mentioned. Yeah, the, I think it's fair to say that the docs see the sustainable growth rate, whole, the whole process is being fundamentally flawed and they're being penalized as asking for something that in any rational world never would have occurred. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 it worked on a model of health care resource consumption in this country which was never valid. And do I agree that we have to put health care and medical doctor-based expenses in a different environment? Absolutely. But a formulaic one based on the, the, the issues that the, the sustainable growth rate one was, um, you, you just didn't sell it to the docs at the beginning. And, and so you never had the buy-in and so you always have that opposition. And I, I agree that it, I, I think that it'll be probably Obama's group on deficit reduction that'll have to figure out a compromise on that one because right now it's written into Medicare codes and so therefore the OMB has to take those numbers into account with their projections. So it's a it's a lose-lose for everybody, I think. Other, yes? The other afternoon I was speaking with a member of the custodian crew who raised the issue if insurance was so big on his mind that he blasted it out at me, you know, almost before a greeting. It's the person that I visited with frequently, you know, over time. And uh, his fear is was that 
youth being forced to buy insurance. And I tried to explain that it worked similarly to uh, um, the way car insurance works uh, by uh, charging a fee if you don't get the insurance. That didn't satisfy because he viewed the issue of being forced to buy insurance for health as different from car insurance for him. I mean, he more or less would be free to not drive if he wanted to, but he doesn't feel free not to um, address health issues. And he's angry about what is going on in medicine in its whole, in its dependency on pharmaceutical answers and not prevention and other ways of addressing health issues? Um, well, a couple of things um, come to mind. First, the first thing I would ask him is if he minds his taxes going toward public education. Because we all, we treat public education as a good, as a public good in this country. We don't seem to mind having our taxes used to subsidize that, whether we have children or not. Um, this is a different funding mechanism. We don't, we're not directly paying it through our taxes as they do in other countries. But part of the rationale of having the individual mandate of forcing everyone to buy health insurance is so that you can get healthy people into the larger pool, stabilize premiums, and uh, actually not have any free riders because everybody will use the health care system one way or another as you go forward. The other thing I would say to him, if it's an economic issue, it sounds like it was a philosophical one or an ideological one, but my guess is that he would probably be eligible for some of the subsidies. There are subsidies, I mean, these things don't kick in until 2014, but up, into, up to 400% of the federal poverty level, individuals will receive subsidies, vouchers, if you will, to purchase health insurance so that it, the amount out of pocket won't exceed a certain percent of your income. As part of the custodial staff, I don't mean to make stereotypes, but my guess is he may fall under that 400% of the federal poverty level and might get some help in affording health insurance. The main issue, I think, is that he doesn't want to have to be forced into somebody else's health care model. He, he has studied enough and read enough and is concerned enough that he, he told me the health healthcare industry is corrupt. All they want to do is give you a pill. That quote unquote. And uh, um, and so when he's forced to buy insurance, he's forced into that system that he doesn't want to go into. I guess part of my problem to start with is. Presumably, if he's on the custodial staff here, he actually has insurance yeah, because uh, he's getting. Uh, so this must be a philosophical yeah, argument. It is. Um, I guess one of my my points I, I, I raised to one of my classes. I just spent some time with the uh, some representatives from China, um, and in China uh, right now, in many sectors, if you don't have insurance, you don't get care. And we don't do that in this country. We actually, if you don't have insurance, it may not be great care. It's certainly not cost-effective care because you're dealing with emergent situations long before, long after they should have been treated. But you do get care in this country. And so there is a good that everyone is getting at some point in return for a system. Right now, we have a system that is being put under great strains because of that. And so people who say, I don't want to buy insurance, they would not recognize themselves as such. But there is a fair amount of free riding that is occurring with that. I think it's fair to say, however, that your custodial colleague understands the system a whole lot better than a lot of people who were talking on TV and writing in the blogosphere. <laughs> So I think that we have to give some credence to his, his issue at the philosophical level, th that he's, he's got the nub there. Um, One of the things with this guy is he listens to a lot of nighttime talk radio. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he had a lot of his ideas come from that. 
totally personal view. Most of the people who have been with me in class know that I think what we need almost as much as we need health reform is a clear object set of objectives and strategies of what our health care system is about. And I'm struck, for example, by the German system. The first thing that they say as they make a decision about health care is <coughs> health care is a manifestation of the principle of solidarity, that everybody does things collectively. We don't say that, and we try to work around it without confronting something like that. And, it, and at some point, we're going to reach, and maybe we have reached that point, that we have to accept that implicitly, and, and I think necessarily explicitly, we eventually have to say that it is part of the nature of being American that we will cover each other for health care services. How that fits into the court system, I don't know. But clearly, um, or, or the whole constitutional structure. <laughs> if, we, if we had a, well, in some countries do it at the constitutional yeah, level. They do. We don't. We don't. <laughs> um, but clearly, that's the the focus around which he has had. He has the most challenge. If that's the answer. Why is it not a similar issue to what we've just seen with the student loan issue? where why should we be paying the health insurance companies anything, and why shouldn't we go directly to single payer? Well, that's a great question, and I think President Obama had said several times, you know, if we were starting from scratch, we'd be doing something probably very different, but you can't take one-sixth of the economy and just turn it on its head. You, th millions of people would lose their jobs, and, and you know, there are ideological positions as well. Um, I would just add that even, I mean, I agree, we, this social compact, the social compact, we, we're pretty fuzzy about that in this country. But that's not to say that our medical infrastructure and our medical system can't stand to be tweaked and changed somewhat. So when your friend says, you know, you know, we don't have prevention, we don't have wellness, they just want us to take a pill, I think there are reasons why we spend more than every other country and our health outcomes aren't as great when you look at infant mortality and life expectancy. This is not a finished job, you know, this is just the first step. We need to address how we spend the dollars that go through the health care system. We need to address why we spend more on health care than on any other good and service in this country. And some of those things mean that we'll have to have new rules and, and hopefully we'll get more back to uh, the kinds of things that are important to the person you were talking to. The, the thing that scares me most about this is that of the three elements of needed reform, this should be the simplest and should have created the least hostile response. All this is is insurance reform, mostly, and it's pretty easy to make healthcare insurers look like bad guys. I mean, you know, the only people you have perhaps more f along that line are Wall Street bankers. Uh, and, and yet, this is a fundamentally divisive issue. So we are not ready to take, as a country, the division and the philosophical confrontation that would have to occur if we said all of a sudden we were going to go to a single payer system or any of those possible alternatives. Today, what, 68% of all Americans are covered by private health insurance. Tried to figure out the numbers. My guess is in 2015, that number may go down to 66% or something like that. Medicaid will certainly have more, but there will be many fewer uninsured, and the exchanges will pick up some enrollment for private. The country is committed to private private health insurance, and um, we have to tinker around the edges, as it were, till we get a much different level of understanding about the costs. The, the, my old mentor uh, from Stanford, Alan Antoven, started helping the Dutch reform their system in 1987. 
he and Michael Porter, Alan is from Stanford Business School, Porter is from Harvard Business School, it took them 20 years to provide not as fundamental change as you're talking about, but to do it relatively well in the Netherlands. So this is, this is more than turning a Titanic. This is turning not a, tit a Titanic with religious intensity and fervor that um, we, we're just, we have, I think the, the best we can do at this point is be thankful for our first step. Um, I was clearly one of those people who had greater expectations for a president who was elected on a change platform. And in reality, the change here is, is marginal, but given the, the public debate and the fervor that was out there, it was, it was clearly the best he could do. And that's where we are. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what I was about to say is I can't decide if I'm worried or not. Um, the one thing that I do think, sometimes at night I wake up and say, the whole thing's going, this was the easy piece, we can't do more. I do think we started a train. And I think that's part of why there was so much fight on this, was there was a recognition, and this is not necessarily rational, it's not, it is political, definitely. But the idea, if you had asked any of us a year ago, would there have been health care reform of any sort passed, I think we all would have said, oh, I hope so, but I doubt it. And history says no. Um, and so I actually do pinch myself periodically in the last week or so in the morning and say, did this really happen? Um, now, part of me worries that it won't stay happening. 2014 is a long time from now, and there's a lot that's going to happen within that. So that's when I do get depressed with it. But I do think part of this is uh, psychological more than even political. And the question is how the psychology is going to play out and how worried or upset people like the custodian you spoke to will be. Yeah. Um, so it sounded like the, a lot of the coverage expansion provisions have to do with modifications of the underwriting process for insurance companies and doing away with, um, you know, uh, pre-existing condition and, and gender as underwriting tools. Um, how will that affect the insurance market and, and what safeguards are in place to prevent withdra the withdrawal of insurance companies from the market, the consolidation of insurance companies, um, and what types of controls are there on them, you know, increasing revenues in other ways? I mean, if they're less able to underwrite, then you know, the argument goes that it'll be more their their costs will not reflect their revenues. So um, they might try to raise fees in other ways. So what types of safeguards are in place? Well, I think I think uh, one of the dirty little secrets in here is that actually I think the insurance companies are going to do quite well. I think there will be consolidation. Um, I mean, they're going to have 32 million new customers, uh, and it's and a third well, of those. Maybe 15. Yeah. The other 15 are going to Medicaid. That's exactly <laughs> right. You're right. But Medicaid contracts mostly Pro with private Pro insurers. Right. So, um, but the Karen Ignami, the the head of the Health Insurance Association of America, said from the get go, "We'll take these regulations." But in return, you have to have an individual mandate in order to prevent adverse selection. So that, you know, people, once, once, you, once you have to take all comers, who, and, and you don't make everybody join, who in their right mind would join until you need it? Which is a terrible way, which is a, a death knell for insurance. So I think the insurance company feels like the insurance mandate is too weak. In year one, the penalty is $95 and then it goes up from there. I think the fear is that um, the young adults, that's the, major, that's the largest demographic group percentage within that, is, that lacks insurance, 19 to 29 year olds. I think the fear is that those healthy people, you all, we really need you in the pool because we're getting old. <laughs> we, need, we need that balance in the pool. And um, so that's another reason why they extended health insurance uh, up to 26 for people being able to stay on their parents' policies. All of these are strategies to, to normalize an insurance pool so that you can spread the risk and stabilize the premiums. 
But in many ways, I believe insurance companies will become like a regulated utility. Is that what you were saying? No, uh, in addition to, to extending coverage under the parents' policy, it did put in place catastrophic coverage that's available right. only for those under 30. Right. So they were really okay. focusing on the market that, that Carolyn was talking about. The, the experience worldwide is if you get that 21 to 30 group thinking about insurance and as part of their daily expenses or annual expenses, they were, are more likely to continue it as they get into the family raising period. But if they jump out and they are free riders in the system for a little while, they've gotten away with it and to come back in is quite expensive. So there were these two mechanisms to try to get that group in, in, into the system. And uh, we'll see if it works. I think the catastrophic coverage idea is a very good one um, for that. There, there's, as far as I can read, though, there's no price support for the, no subsidy. no premium subsidy for that. It's market rate. So the insurance companies ought to be pretty careful about the way they price that one. In terms of this mandate for insurance coverage, and also kind of going with the idea of a marginal change, how do you think the lack of a public option in the final bill affects that and the FTC? Do you want to address that? I'm not sure. Um, you know, when I look at the different costing things, there are arguments that on um, the exchanges, the public option would have been more expensive than the potential private options. But I think we're speaking very theoretically right now because we don't even know what the exchanges will look like and they may look different in different states and have different options within that. Some of the public option is being drawn in by the Medicaid uh, increases. Um, so I don't actually know whether it will make a difference or not. The, the other argument with it is the competition issue and will it, uh, but they tried to address a lot of those issues in the because they knew they weren't going to get a public option. So a lot of those issues are trying they're trying to address through the statute. Yeah, to build on what Mimi said earlier, I think the public option for those who believed it in a certain way was a philosophical statement. I, I think the, it was never predicted to be a big factor in the marketplace, and I think there were. A, apparently a small group of people who really wanted to be able to make the statement as a first step toward perhaps a single payer that the government should become more activist in delivering health care and that's what that's what the re that's how the recoil was so strong because there were a whole lot more people who felt that the opposite was true and politically they would have lost the support of the physicians and the hospitals had they put that in because it initially was indexed to Medicare rates. So by definition, they would have taken lower, re they would have had lower reimbursements in order to mitigate that and also to s sort of satisfy the health insurance industry. They said, okay, okay, we won't do that. Uh, we'll make it some sort of average market insurance reimbursement rate, which then lost all of its power to drive down reimbursements. So, uh, I think in the end, politics had to win in order to let, you know, perfect not be the enemy of good and get a bill passed. Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, with this Stupak amendment and the executive order, um, how will that work, the implementation of that order work in, insofar as the federal subsidies for the insurance companies go and that sort of thing? I mean, I... I'll let you like, answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> so... Because it's really not law, it's function. Right. No, I mean, the executive... Are you talking about the, it, does the executive order carry the power of law, or just what does it say? Well, how, how will it work? All right, well, and the way it'll work is, at least theoretically, that uh, there'll be this insurance exchange, and there'll be these group plans that are offered on the exchange, and the group plans may or may not offer abortion services, but if they do, the abortion service has to be carved out as a rider, as an insurance rider, so that anyone who comes to the exchange, whether they're paying by one, their own money or the voucher, 
they have to write a separate check for the rider to make sure that there's this firewall between federal dollars and the abortion rider. Now, the problem, Kathleen Parker in the Post last Sunday wrote a really interesting article about this if you want to go back and look at it, because the, uh, the pro-life contingent uh, says that the Senate bill that, that passed, you know, the, the bill that ultimately passed, really doesn't uphold the Hyde Amendment 100%, which says no federal dollars can be used for abortion services because there's this new infusion of federal dollars going to community health centers. And community health centers, while today may not offer abortion services, certainly could in the future, and if they did, you would have federal dollars flowing towards abortion services. The Hyde Amendment right now is only under Health and Human Services, and it has to be reapproved every year. So it's only in the Medicaid program for the most part. So once you leak federal dollars out beyond that, will you still have be able to have that? You know, and that's that's the debate. That's where the pro-life folks say you're not going to be able to control it, and there are going to be federal dollars that subsidize it, and the pro-choice group says, no, 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 it's good enough, and, you know, we can, you know, no federal dollars will be used, and I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So, so the bill includes expansion of funding for community health centers, is that supposed to be part of the prevention and wellness? Yeah, they, there's a lot of money for community health centers, in fact, they're going to double the number of patients community health centers can see over the next X many years. There's a, I think there's a recognition that all these people are going to have health insurance and, so, and Medicaid, right. and, and, there's got, and we have too few physicians as it is, and we have to be able to absorb some of that, and so they're going to increase the capacity partially through new community health centers. There's the pre-existing conditions issue. I just I don't know enough of the details. Are we assuming that the larger pool will be enough on its own to to offset the costs, the higher costs for people with pre-existing conditions? Will there not be additional fees or something for someone who otherwise wouldn't have had insurance in the first place? Is it just the pool? Is that going to be enough? I don't think the pool's the only money. There's other money flowing into the system, some of it coming through Medicare adjustments and things like that. So, so those. well, it covers different premium things. So all of this is mixed right. together in a way. Um, so you can't take one piece and do cost benefit in that. You actually have to take the whole pool together. Um, and well, and we know that three quarters of all healthcare dollars go are, are can be attached to chronic conditions, chronic illnesses. Some of those could be pre-existing conditions, and there is language in the legislation to set up these things called patient-centered medical homes. There are financial incentives to uh, to actually coordinate care and manage disease better, which might mitigate some of the problems that we're seeing. And it's not like people with pre-existing conditions now aren't being treated in the health system and we're not paying for it in other ways. So, Just emergently. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a good question because it's a, it's a matter of, but remember we have this rule in health policy called the 80-20 rule. And that is that 80% of all the dollars go to 20% of the population. So if we can get the majority of the population who are relatively healthy most of the time into a pool and have them have, have them have health insurance and have that amortized, then I, I think there will be definite gains. All right, thank you. Our time is actually up just now. So thank you all for coming and thank our three wonderful speakers.